Hey, welcome to 10X Your Team with Cam and Otis. We're a father-son leadership podcast where we talk with other lifelong learners about making an impact and solving big problems. And you know what? Uh, we were all talking about uh, the weather mm-hmm. and uh, from thunderstorms to bright shiny to the gray dreariness of Central Europe. And, uh, you know, those of us who live in in uh, these wonderful sunshiny places like Colorado Springs uh, and uh, I'll give you some Arizona, Arizona sunshine, Tucson. Uh, it is we get spoiled. Mm-hmm. We get spoiled with our sunshine. You know, in Colorado Springs, we always talk about our 300 days of shine. And I tell you what, those of us who live here, we count it. And we get that one dreary day and we all mope around. Like, where's my 300 days of shine? <laughs> Camden, do you, do, do, do you Tucsonians get that mopey around when you get a little bit of gray sky? We do. We got a rain. We've been having rain here for like two days. It's going to keep going another day or so. Uh, and yeah, it is amazing how fast it affects the mood down here. It is immediate <laughs> dreariness. Like, I don't want to go work. I don't want to do anything. I just need it. It's almost like a snow day. It's honestly what it reminds me of growing up in Colorado, the snow days where there's a lot. And you're just like, all right, I don't, we don't need to do anything today. That's what rain does here. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, you, hey, folks, uh, joined by a good friend of ours, a uh, fellow veteran, uh, Phil Bragg. And uh, Phil, when you're when you're running the distill, the, the still, the distillery and the distillery. You don't take a snow day. You don't take a dreary day, do you? <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, first off, thanks for having me on today. But no, when you, uh, you know, when it's time to distill, you just, you distill. You just got to do it when you got to do it. Distill does not care what the weather's like. Here, Here's a question, because I, I, I might have uh, run a still or two in my time. Uh, I can neither confirm nor deny that. But I got a question for you. I just thought of this in my maybe getting a little too nerdy on it. Have you noticed a difference in the taste of that sweet liquor when it comes out of the still? How, if the weather affects it, whether it's a snowy day, a cold day, a gray day, sunshiny day? You know, I really haven't noticed that much. I think the, uh, you know, probably the biggest difference is we can't open up, you know, when it's really cold, you can't open up the back door and get some fresh air in there. And a lot of people don't know is distilling it doesn't always smell amazing. Got some off smells and uh, it's nice when you can open up and get fresh air, but on these cold days, you just got to shut it down and deal with it. <laughs> that, that is so true. I, I'd actually forgotten about that. And some of those smells, man, it's like, and they don't like when you're brewing beer, right? You know, that's that sweet, sweet smell, of the hops and the, and the, the yeast all working together. When you're on a still, there's some, there's some things coming out of there that it's like, I, I hope it don't taste like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's a fact. It varies from product to product. There's some that smell, you know, they're all right. And uh, there's a couple like when we make rum, it is, uh, it is a horrible smell. And mm-hmm. thankfully, the smell does not t- carry over to the product because the product tastes good and smells good. Oh, and, and it does because uh, I have had samples of that, among other things. Uh, and just... Uh, Remind folks, it is 1350 distilling in Colorado Springs, and uh, I can vouch for excellent products, uh, which which me and Miss Suzanne enjoy. Uh, and and you know, I could I could spend all day talking about digging in with a distillery and the distilling process and the and uh, that whole thing because I just find it fascinating. But I, I I also find leadership fascinating. And one of the things that I'm, I've been thinking about all morning, you know, because I always check my calendar. It's like, oh, cool, got filled today. All right, because I got this this burning question that's really been at the top of my mind it is how you take something that you're so passionate about and you just love the the doing of it. You know, I'm wiggling, I'm squeezing my fingers together because you're doing it right. It's, it's between your fingers and you start to share it with other people and you know that you got to lead those other people. Walk us through that, that kind of mixture. Cause this, this ain't no little still out in the backyard that, you know, you're just doing for you and, and the wife and your buddies sort of thing. This is 
a real like no shit still that you got out back. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know, Otis, if it was me, uh, but I, part of that got blocked. Cam, did you hear the whole thing? It might be on my end. Uh, no, I think I think you cut out for a second there, Dad. But uh, for the gist of it, it, see, it seemed like it was the leadership of kind of build, building the thing up and keeping that passion alive as you grow it. Yeah, yeah, sharing. It's, yeah, it's something that yeah. you're real passionate well, about I think that, that you love. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, in the military, we spend a lot of time, you know, developing, teaching and developing leadership. And I think that um, when you are creating a business, um, it's going it, to, oh, let me just re rephrase it. Sometimes we think that it, that leadership just exists in the military and it's sort of a military exclusive thing. Um, but that's not the case. Leadership is everywhere. I think every human being uh, wants to be led and has the desire, you know, and then a lot of people have a desire to lead. It's a natural human tendency. And so when you're starting a business, that leadership is just as important because, you know, business is hard. It is tough there. You know, uh, starting a business is not for the faint of heart. And so, the, you know, you have this idea, you have this mission subjective, and you have to figure out how am I going to get from where I am, not just me, but my whole team from this point to that point, what are the intermediate objectives I need to achieve? And then you have to influence all these people to convince them to go along with you on this journey that honestly is very fraught with risk. And, um, but it also has a lot of opportunity. So all those things are about leadership, right? You know, when Alexander the Great was leading his army forward, you know, it was like, hey, this is not an easy thing. We're gonna go do something no one's ever done before. And um, it might be amazing, but you also might, you know, there's a lot of risk on the way. And so that's really kind of how a small business is. Um, and then, you know, you're creating something that's never existed before. What was one of those first moments where that risk reared its ugly head and you really had to, you know, batten down the hatches, get people on this path forward and really sell them on that vision? Yeah, well, I, I will say there, I could tell you too, that happened way earlier than I expected. Um, the first was before we even had opened our doors, um, we we were in the middle of construction and the city that, um, changed the requirements uh, for fireproofing in our building that we had already had approved and we're in the middle of construction on. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were at a junction point where, you know, we did not have enough budget, you know, to do all these changes. And, you know, I, you know, it was sort of like I felt, you know, a little bit like. Um, like Caesar there, like we, we're going to cross the Rubicon and we can't go back. Right. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to we're, we're now going to make a step forward. And, you know, we're going way beyond what we anticipated from a budgetary standpoint. And I had to convince everybody on the team that it was worth it because we could have easily turned around at that point. You know, we would have uh, we could just stopped and went back, you know, took our losses and, and moved forward. But we didn't. We went forward. That was the first one. Um, and then the second one, you know, we, after we opened our doors, we had been open for five months when COVID hit. And now our entire business model was built around building a destination distillery where people would come and, and to our beautiful taste room and do tours and tastings. And it was all built around this amazing retail experience. And all of a sudden that is completely shut down. And so, you know, you, you, that that's your business plan. And then you have to look at yourself and say, OK, do we just do we just give up right now? And, you know, and and take what we can and get out or do we, do we try to change and do we try to adapt and push through it? So, you know, those are just the first two that happened, you know, less than a year from us really getting started. <laughs> uh, I'd love to yep. dive in a little bit more on either, either one of those or both uh, in the sense of not necessarily the leadership aspect of getting, selling everyone on the vision, but of your own like personal calculus there as the leader of, okay, is this still the path forward? Do we need to recalculate on it? it? Shoot, is it time to just give it up and go on to the next idea? We, you know, talk us through that. Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing is that, you know, I'm a big believer in planning. So we had a very detailed business plan going forward. And I think that that's absolutely critical for those people out there that are thinking about a business right now. You absolutely have to build a business plan. And then the first thing you have to recognize after you're done is you're, this is not the business plan you're going to execute. This is just going to give you a starting point to make adjustments off of. Um, and so, you know, for me personally, I think it was kind of two things. One is I really did believe then, and I still believe now that we have all the ingredients to make an, an amazing business. 
Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about um, what we what we wanted to be as a business and what elements we needed to um, be excellent in to make an excellent business. So I believed from the beginning that we had all the elements there. We just had to execute them. Uh, so that was the first part. I think if I would have had less confidence in what we were doing or, or uncertainty about uh, the belief in our product and our in our our business, you know, it would have been very easy to turn back. Um, but the second thing is, I I just I'm not I just refuse to fail. So you know I, you know I, we reach a certain point and and I'm just I'm just not going to fail. So we're going to figure out a way through it. You know, and that's I think again I think for those veterans that are transitioning in business you are gonna it's not easy it's tough and there's gonna be times where you know you're gonna question yourself question everything you do and you just have to believe that you can succeed and you can make it through and you just keep and you just keep grinding you know that's all you can do talk to us a little bit about that that first failure that you you said you really started to say all right is this is this the one you know, or throw up your hands or, or whatever. But, you know, that that first one that you said, oh, shit, really? Here we go. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, it, to, to be honest, I think the one that really was was the one that got me closest was, happened about a year ago when, um, without going into the detail, you know, so we, we push through this stuff, right? We push through the construction. We got the business running. We get to COVID. We make it through COVID barely, but we make it through. And then there's a little known fact of, of what happened in the liquor industry here in Colorado. They made some changes to the laws that affected our primary customers, which are liquor stores. And so our, you know, after all this stuff and we got through all this thing, you know, our primary customer now um, gets hit really hard. And obviously that affects our sales. And so it, it, we realized uh, that, you know, our, our, our previous vision of what we wanted to do, our, our business model, we were going to have to make another change. Okay. After I've been telling my business team, no, we've, we made all the changes. We were on the right track. And then, you know, due to circumstances outside of our control, legal and, and you know, environment that we work in, we realized that we have to make another change to our business model. And that's where I was, I, you know, I, at times I just felt like I, you know, it's, you, you can only go back to the well so many times with people and tell them, no, you have to, you have to believe me. This is the right thing to do. We're changing. This is the right thing to do. Um, so that was at the point where I said, you know, I, I, I wasn't certain that, that the rest of my team was going to go along with it, that they were going to say, yeah, this is the right thing to do. And um, it, it was, it was a very painful process, but we finally came to the conclusion that we had to change our business model. We had to go to more of a distribution model. Um, and we really shifted last year into more of a distribution model. And we're seeing, we're seeing the fruits of that. Now we realize that Colorado just cannot support our business due to these changes in the regulatory environment. And so we had to move outside of our market, which, you know, from a craft perspective is a very difficult thing because you know, I, I believe I make good products, great whiskeys, great rums, great gin, but there's a lot of great products on the market. There's a lot of good th whiskey. I have a whole shelf of them, right? So, you know, why would people buy 1350? Well, people would buy 1350 because they come here, they hear our story, they believe in us, they, they want to be part of what we're doing here. That's easy to do when the people live 20 miles from you. But how do you sell that vision to people that are halfway across the country? How do you sell that vision to sales reps that you will never meet? It, it's a whole different set of problems that um, we, we're having to work through right now. Is that uh, is that a bit of a silver lining at this point? Because I could also see that after having worked through it, of like now you know how to sell that vision to people that aren't even going to meet you, and then it's like, oh, now it's so much easier to. I mean, sorry, sorry for the turn of the phrase, but bottle to bottle up that vision and pass it out to people, right? Right. Right. Well, I will tell you that what it's made us is incredibly passionate. So uh, the feedback we received from people that, um, so a little known fact about the spirit industry, most of the products that are on the shelf when you go in there are not made by craft distillers. They're made by, they're, they're manufactured products, right? They're brands, essentially. Um, and there's very few things on the shelf that are actually made by real people. Now, um, most of consumers don't realize that, um, but the distributors do, you know, they know. 
And um, for them, I think a lot of the folks we've talked to, it's been very refreshing to talk to people who actually make the product and believe, you know, that they have their own story about their own product. It's not just a label. And so that what I think, Cam, like the, the, mm -hmm. the distillation of all of the things that we've gone to has made us very passionate about our brand. And that comes through when we talk to people um, and, and they're, and they're very motivated. I, uh, our current um, broker in California told us that, you know, he said something, he says, I get 20 or 30 companies come to me every month. He's like, the minute I saw your brand, I knew I was going to add you to my portfolio because I really believe in what you're doing. You know, so when you have a professional tell you that, right, I'm not, I start, I'm, I, I like to think of myself as a person. I started out, we're amateurs, right? We started this from scratch five years ago. But when you have a, out, a liquor spirit professional tell you something like that, then, it, 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 you know, those are the indicators and signals that you're doing the right thing. And, and you might not be there yet, but you're, but you're on the right track. How do you, and, and uh, this is probably a little bit from a, one of my clients this morning, but how do you handle the employee, the, the, the in, inability to be the, the gunny, if you will, in, this, in a situation where you've got, I know I'm making a huge shift on us, uh, so sorry about that, but I've just been, this has been gnawing at me. Uh, but how do you, how do you handle that? And what's the, what's the, the lessons that you've gained, you know, because one of my client this morning, uh, another vet, and that was one of the things is like, man, I can't just tell them, yeah. just do it, you know, yeah. God damn it, cause I'm in charge. Uh, got to convince them. How do you handle that situation? I mean, cause we all, we all know the legends of, of what being around a gunny is like, and <laughs> right. Yeah, that only works in the Marine Corps. Huh? It doesn't even really work in the Army. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like, you know, I, yeah, I was in the Marines for 27 years. So we have a very distinct leadership style in the Marines, right? Um, and um, most people it doesn't work on directly. But um, and, and, I, and, and employees are challenging. I mean, honestly, that's probably the, the toughest part of the whole job, right? It's just finding the right people. And I think that you really have to change and modify your leadership style. So it's not that you're not leading, you're just leading in a different way. Mm -hmm. And the thing, the part of it is finding the right people, you know, hiring slowly, making sure that you bring people on that um, have bought into what you're doing. They're not just looking for a job. Um, and then, you know, I spend a lot, a lot of time explaining to my people, like mm -hmm. what we're doing, our vision, how we're going about it, what we're trying to achieve, you know, uh, there's a great, great quote that um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to totally butcher, but, it, you know, it, it says, you know, if you want to if you want to convince people to sail across uh, to build a ship to sail across the sea, you don't convince them how fun it is to build ships. Right. You you tell them about the beauty of crossing the sea in the middle of the night. Right. And then they'll build the ship. And that's kind of how what I try to do. I try to make sure everybody's part of the vision that they understand what we're doing here. We're not it's not just. Um, you know, we're not just making booze, right? We're, we're, we're doing, we're trying to do bigger and better things. And, um, and, and people, you know, uh, pe people respond to it. You know, we've, we've had our first two employees that we've ever hired still work for us today. Um, so, you know, and we don't pay a lot of money. I mean, I'd love to say that we pay, you know, a kingly sum, but we don't. Um, and so they, they're staying with us because they believe in what we're doing and they're trying to help us achieve our goals. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest thing and it is a transition, right? You can't just tell people to shut up and do what I tell you. That's not, that's not going to work. It's not, not a good. <laughs> was it tempting at all when you were in the early stages of building that team to go that route and just go get all the Marines so you could talk like that to them and build that leadership style or take us a little bit through that decision? Cause honestly, as you were talking, asking your question that I started thinking like myself, like rugby. I'm like, yeah, it would be kind of nice to have just a bunch of rugby guys I can yell at. Like, yeah. you know, it does work pretty well. You know, <laughs> there's something to be yeah. said for it. Uh, yeah, no, I'm tempted every single day to do that, actually. <laughs> uh, I, you know, part of what saved me is I don't live in a Marine town. So there's not a lot of Marines here, you know. And so probably if I lived, you know, in, in, uh, in Jacksonville, North Carolina, I probably would have done that. Uh, but I didn't really have an option. In fact, Honestly, my, my original vision was to hire all veterans and I just couldn't find the right people. The first two employees that were, have no military experience, you know, which was not what I wanted to do. That was the opposite of what I wanted to do. But 
I had to do it. You know, I had, I hired them and, and, you know, they're still with us. So, um, but that kind of opened me up to the other thing is like, I want to hire veterans. I definitely do. And we try to do that, but there's a lot of other great people out there, you know, and the thing about running a small business is that I, that I did not anticipate that I did not think about was the satisfaction that you get from providing people income, right? Like you are, you are putting food on their table, you know, and, 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 and clothing their kids. That's an amazing feeling. You know, I always tell people the hardest part about coming out of the military is replacing your sense of duty and the higher things that you serve. Right. And that's really, really hard to replace. Um, and people don't think about, Hey, when you own a business and you hire people, you are literally putting clothes on their kids. That's a, that's an amazing thing. Okay. And, and, and you should be proud of that. And you should, that should make you feel good. So as a small business owner, entrepreneur, like that, that should be part of your goal as a business owner. What are yeah. some ways that you still took that Marine approach to leadership and applied, applied basically your military background to the leadership structure? You know, we already eliminated all the yelling and, you know, the motherfuckers and all yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff. Probably no PT and pushups. Like, like what did you take that you applied? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's, there's really three things. One is planning. We, we took essentially the military decision-making process and we, I have put that into our business. Nobody knows. I don't call it that. They, uh, it's just our planning process and they don't realize we're doing it. But that's what we do. Um, because, um, I, you know, I, it, it works. Um, the second thing is clear expectations, clear expectations, right? I mean, the one great thing about the military is there's the standards are completely 100% clear. You always know every day where you stand with them. Right. And I think in a lot of civilian companies, that's not the case. Uh, uh, expectations are very unclear. So we try to make our, so our, our, um, our expectations very, very clear. And then to follow that up with accountability, right? When people are not meeting the expectations, you either train them and teach them to get better or you get rid of them. Simple as that. It doesn't have to be emotional. I don't get emotional about it. I just tell them, hey, this is the expectation. You're not meeting it. We can even help you get better at it or you can just leave. I can't yell at that, 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 you know, that's... it's the same. <laughs> you just have to take the emotion out of it. Yeah, I think that's, that's one of the hard things to do uh, because taking the emotion, it, you know, you're still emotional. Yeah. Yeah. You can't really take it out, but how do you do that? How do you have those tough conversations? And, and uh, you know, when the, when the guy you're talking to is pushing back or making excuses or, or whatever, and how do you, how do you stay at that, that even keel is, is tough. It's, it's very, not yeah, easy. It's tough. Yeah. Especially when it's your business and you've built it, it's your money invested. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, when people waste, like they're wasting your money, they're not wasting a company's money. They're wasting your money. You know, when people, you know, break things or do things wrong, like it's literally taking money out of your pocket. So it, it, can, it can very easily turn emotional. But again, I, you know, I spent most of my military career working and training myself to maintain and control my emotions. So I try to do that. I try to continue to do that because emotions never help. It's, it's never, you, the more emotion you bring into it, it's a losing proposition for everybody, yourself and the person you're dealing with. Oh yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, when you get emotional, you get angry or, or sad, you, you allow that to come in and take over it. It, your blinders get narrower yep. and narrower and, you know, next thing you know, you're yelling and screaming and telling somebody they're fired. And, and it's like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you the know? same things when you're dealing with customers, you know, you get a review online that, you know, is unfair, you know, um, or, you know, you think is wrong or, or mean spirited. And, you, you know, people, I think in this day and age, don't realize how hard it is to build a business. And then somebody puts a review that, you know, that, and, you know, your immediate response is to fire back of all guns blazing. And you just, you can't do that. Right. It's just not, it does not, it's a lose lose for you. So you have to step back and, you know, I always tell my, my guys, just like, if you're upset, don't send it, step back, talk about, let's talk about a little more. Let's, let's figure out the appropriate tactical and strategic response and then respond that way. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like the, uh, the post game, the post game talk, uh, with the, with the parents, right. Yeah. You always put a 24 hour gap on that. It's like, mm -mm, yeah, no, yeah. 
So as an example, we you know we ship direct to consumer, but we use a third party. Uh, we can't legally, it's, it's illegal for us to do it. We have to legally use a third party. So when people buy through that, of course, if there's a problem, they come back to us uh, to it uh, about it, you know? And so there's really not a lot we can do. We have to refer them to them to deal with the problem. And, and you know, with, just like anything, there's always issues. There's so, something comes up. And um, so somebody gave us a one-star review on Google, which again, it, you know, that's a, you know, tough thing. We have a 4.9 rating. So, you know, that bring, you know, that's a, you know, when you get a one star, it brings you down. And, um, and it was for something that we had zero control over. Right. Mm -hmm. So their immediate response is to tell them they don't know what the hell they're talking about. You, you know, you, you didn't read the terms and conditions of the, of the, of the purchase that you made and blah, 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 but you can't really do that. You know, that, that sets up something I, I was really interested to talk to you about, which is the the like artistic approach to to your business, which is when it comes down to it, you know, like dad, you even kind of accidentally joked about this in the intro question of like running the still versus running the distillery. There is like a difference there. Yeah, uh, I'm yeah. really interested in how you keep that like creativity that obviously would have brought you to distilling in the first place and keeping that going as you grew the business. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't do it alone. That's the, the shortest answer. So I have a business partner and mm -hmm. we have uh, created a very good uh, division of labor. So, you know, I do the production and the business side and he does the marketing and sales. And I, I would say the more creative part. When I came to him, I had this vision of what I wanted to be, what I felt the marketplace was lacking. And, um, you know, I, my, my, creativity in that realm is pretty uh, limited um and he basically took that idea and he created the brand and 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 all the stuff around the product that we have it's very creative and 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 amazing i could not have done that myself and so i think that would be one of the lessons i would tell people you know it's all you know it's tempting to go it alone but you got to find partners and you got to find the right partners and those partners are generally people who don't have the same skill set that you do, which again, I think runs counter to your intuition. You know, most people get, a, you know, you hang out with people that are like you, that's just human nature. And, but, and so when you start a business, you're like, oh, I got a friend or I got a, a guy I know who's very, you have to, you have to find people that are opposite of you that have skill sets that are different than yours. And you got to figure out how to work with those folks. Uh, in, in that same creativity vein, though, and going into, you know, your your aspect of the creativity, you know, of the ceiling yeah. and that side of it, there's another piece that I think is unique to your, your type of business, which is you could be the, like, the crazy artist who's like, no, this is the best whiskey. You don't know what you're talking about, Otis. This is the best. Yeah. And you could keep doing that, and you could go nowhere in life, and you could just convince yourself that you have the best thing and just falling yeah. in love with your bottle there rather than listening to the customers and kind of going through that balance of, look, this is my passion here, but also I got to listen to what people think. Could you talk yeah. us a little bit through of finding that balance and not just getting overly obsessed with, you know, like your, your perfect solution, if you put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. I mean, so the first thing is that when in this particular type of business, um, you're, it's a matter of taste, right? I mean, there, and there's a broad spectrum of tastes all across the country, right? So one of the things that learned was really hard for me at first, but now I've come to accept it, is that no matter what you make, there's gonna and that you think is awesome, like there's gonna be people that don't like it. And it's and it's and that's just okay, right? Like some people like red shirts and some people like black shirts. Like it's whatever you, you like is what you like. Okay. So you first, the first thing you have to come to re accept is that you, you can't please everybody that the things you like are not gonna be the things everybody else likes. Um, but on that, on the, the other vein is that it's really hard. So like take, we have a pretty broad portfolio, vodka, gin, rum, and whiskey. Well, I personally don't drink all of those things. I am a gin whiskey person. So now I'm making vodka and rum and I have to find and create a product that will appeal to people. Um, and I do a lot of that with, you could maybe call it market testing. Um, but using the people around us to taste and try the different things that I make and tell me you know, what is, is this good? Is, you know, will people buy this? Because, you know, the other thing is you can't, you can't create a thousand products, right? You have to, you have to whittle them down from a production standpoint, 
you know, I, you know, I have ideas all the time and I'm like, well, I, I can't, I, I can only bottle so many things. Right. Um, so, you know, to, to limit it down to, to the, to the, to what you can do is, you know, I, I use a lot of input from other people. Um, I get feedback and I always say, you know, I want to make a product that tastes good, not to everybody, but to a lot of people, you know, to most people that try it, they should say, yeah, this tastes good. It may not be, you know, I, you know, the number one rum in the world, but is it a good rum that people like and they were going to buy and I can make it, then that's, that's kind of what I settled on. And I try not to how make you, things the way I like them. How did you, because this is another uh, really important business decision to make is how did you decide who your avatar was? You know, who's your perfect client? Because I, I you know, with, especially in, in your industry, it could be so broad that you get lost in, you know, in the minutia of yeah. everything. Yeah. I, I you're breaking up on but yeah. Um, so one of the things that, you know, obviously you do your market research at the beginning, we did a lot of market research. The good thing about doing market research at distilleries is they're a lot of fun, right? Um, <laughs> go visit a lot of distilleries, you try a lot of booze, you kind of start to say, okay, where do we want to be in the market? Where are the gaps? You know, and you start kind of whittling down where you want to be. Um, and then you and then you try to develop a product to fit that gap in the market where you where you think you need to be. But the I think the key thing is you have to always be aware of the market and what it's telling you. Okay. Because you know, there's certain thing about being visionary, right? And you you need to have a vision, but you also need to be flexible enough to adapt that vision to the realities of the market. Okay. So one of the things, for example, is I said I would never when we started off, I said I would never do a bourbon. Okay. Now people look at me like I'm crazy and they say, why would you never do a bourbon? Well I would tell people bourbon's like making a chocolate cake. Like you, you, it's, it's such a constrained thing due to the nature of the product that it's not very interesting from a distiller's perspective. It's, it's pretty much boring. Okay. So, and I like, I don't want to do boring things. I want to do things that nobody's doing. Okay. Um, or, and so, but guess what, what do people love bourbon? So then at a certain point you're like, we have to make money here. People are crying for bourbon. Let's make it, let's do bourbon. Okay. So that's one example. Another example is I toured a ton of distilleries, probably I would say over 50 distilleries all over the country. And when I came back, I said, okay, our target demographic is a male between 30 and 60, um, you know, above average income. That's our target demographic. Well, after the first year, we realized that 60% of our clientele are women. Mm. Yeah, I'm a military themed distillery in Colorado Springs. 60% of my clientele are women. That caught me completely off guard. Yeah, that, I wouldn't have bet on that one. <laughs> no. And so, you know, and so we started to ask yourself, why? Well, one of the reasons is we have a really, really nice cocktail lounge, right? Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful mm -hmm. and it's comfortable. And there's, um, we have the nice, we won actually the award for the, the nicest restrooms in Colorado Springs. So we have really, really nice, clean restrooms. And then we were, and the other thing is we were doing really unique events that other people weren't doing, like cocktail pairings with cookies and with, with donuts and all these different things. And what it was doing without our knowledge was inadvertently drawing in a lot of female uh, people, uh, uh, customers. And so, you know, we just leaned into that. And so now we do macrame classes. We do cookie decorating classes. We do all kinds of different things that are oriented towards women. That again, if you would ask me three years ago, I would have laughed at you if we to say we were going to do them, right? So you know, tell that, us about the, that. Uh, that I think another interesting thing, and we kind of touched on this earlier with the you know trying to please everybody versus you know just sticking with your vision and finding that balance there. How do you make sure you're connecting that like market research aspect back to you know those core elements that you want? You know, I I'm just picturing, and this is a kind of just simple, funny example, but it's like, you know, you're painting the walls pink and all that kind of stuff. It's like, oh, this is what the market said. And then you oh, go right. down that rabbit hole and you lose your team or you lose the target audience because you were wrong about it. Like, how do you yeah. balance that input with making too many changes? Yeah, no, that's great. That's a great question. And, and I don't think there's a, a magic answer to it. I think one thing is we have a very clear vision of what we want to be. And um, part of that 
was providing unique experiences. Uh, that was a that was a big you know uh, a part of what we wanted to do that other people were not doing. You know, we're in a warehouse, and when people see us, they walk in the front door, they're blown away by the inside of it because it looks like we're in a warehouse, and yet it's probably one of the nicest cocktail lounges in the city. So it's all about that experience. So that's where we can take events like what you just said. Like we don't have to change everything we're doing. We just ask ourselves, okay, we have this demographic that we weren't aware of. What are the unique experiences that we can do within what we're already doing that can continue to bring in more of that demographic, right? So we're not changing what we're doing. We're just using what we're, our, our previous existing vision to encompass more people. I, I'd love to, because because something that's going on there, we haven't actually talked about it, but it's but it's there. It, it's it's staying within your values, and as long you you can do as my buddy Jason always says. Shout out to you, brother. Uh, Jason always says you you know a million micro pivots, right? Yeah. But you got to have that that foundation of values. What did you do to establish the values for thirteen fifty distilling? Yeah, no, that's a great question, and I agree one hundred percent with that. And what we did, and I give full credit this to my my business partner Jake. Um, we when we were first starting out, before we even had a building, uh, we did we did an exercise where we 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 defined the words that we wanted our business to be. And so we did this exercise over a couple hours and we ended up refining it down to a series of eight different words that described what we wanted our business to be. And we have not changed one of those at all. Uh, everything we do still remains within that context. And so I think that that's the key thing. You got to have a clear vision about what you want to be as a business. Uh, that, and I think that applies to any business. I mean, obviously we're a retail customer focused business, but if you have a business to business uh, type of, of, of organization, it does, I think it's just as important, right? You have to ask yourself, what is it that you want to be? When people think about your business, what, what are the words that you want them to think about you? And then if you have that, then you can build that, right? Because that's what a business is. You're building something. You just start from nothing. So, you, you know, it's like a building, right? Like you, the, the ground, it's the dirt ground and you have to build it. So what is it going to look like when it's done? If you don't have a clear understanding of that, a clear perception of that, you'll never get there. You can change, you can move a door here or paint the inside walls a different color, whatever, but you have to have a vision of what the final thing's going to be. And we all know what color the walls are going to be when Camden opens his distillery. They're going to be pink. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm hey, the down story, the somebody's going to make a million off of it. <laughs> you never know. You never know. You know, Camden loves his pink Whitney. I mean, <laughs> not anymore. I'm too old for that now, Dad. Come on, I'm 28. There's oh, so much okay. sugar in that. Read, come on, come on. That's yeah, that's, that's old. That's old, Camden. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, Bill, what it, I what I'd love to we we touched on this a little bit earlier. Uh, I'd love to get into a little bit of the analysis in that. In the, the experimentation, R&D, shiny object, and the finite capital, and how you, what's your decision process for that of maybe we need to have a, a mint flavored gin mm -hmm. in, our, in our products or whatever, and how do you balance that? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's great, but I, and I, I think that the, it kind of goes back, I, I, I think, to the same thing, right? You have to decide, okay, if this is, so uh, just for in our particular example, our idea was we are going to have a, a product line for each branch of the military, okay? And within those product lines, you are going to have a base product, a flavored product, and a premium product, okay? So... That was the layout that we had from the very beginning. Now, we're not there yet. We have nine products. We're getting there. Well, someday we will. Uh, building, creating nine products has been a lot. Uh, so we've kind of taken a, a pause on all that. Um, but you can see that, um, it, for an example, our vodka, we have our Minuteman vodka, and then we have our Old Blood and Guts strawberry vodka. No, what we have not created yet is our premium vodka. So on my board, there's a blank right there of, of the product that we're going to create someday. But the vision has not changed. That's how we've we've been able to constrain 
you know, the, the good idea fairy, because trust me, the good idea fairy comes up a lot. And it's like, we should, oh, maybe we should do this. You know, people come in, oh, I love your stuff. Why can't you do this? Blah, blah, blah. And I just go back to, this is the plan. We're going to stick with the plan. As we have time and resources, we're going to continue to grow our product line until we reach where our product line's at. Once we get to that point, then I'm open to suggestions, but we're not going to do anything outside of that until we get to that point. You, you talked earlier about how you had, uh, I think the way you put it was like, you had all the elements to make a great business. And then it was yeah. kind of figuring out where to put those different elements and, you know, fine tuning those things as you go. Could you talk about how your values connected into those like specific business elements, you know, how being it, I, just to throw an example out, but you know, how being uh, kind to our customers led to, it's like, okay, we need to hire this position in order to do that or whatever that looks like for y'all. Yeah. So that, no, that's great. And I, I would say that the elements actually came first before the, the vision, because what I did during the market research phase is I went around to all these distilleries and, you know, you know, get my inspection report out. And I just was saying, OK, what are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? What could they do better? And over time, I kind of distilled it down into these certain elements of what you needed to create a great distillery. Mm. When we did that, then we did our value statement. And now you've got this, you know, your objectives and your values. Now you have to operationalize it, right? You have to turn it into reality. And that's really where I think the military planning process is such a great tool that it gets, un, you know, that and as a veteran, you have, you know, it's inherent part of what, everything you do. And it's really about operationalizing that. So what we do from there is we, we say, okay, so every year we sit down and we build our goals and we say, okay, um, for this year, these are the goals that we have. Boom, 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 boom. And then we assign each one of those goals to a person on our team and they have to break it down into sub objectives. Okay. We have to do this. We have to do this. So, you know, and we, I say, okay, what do you need to do to get to that point over the course of the next year? Break that down into specific tasks and then assign those tasks out to people with timelines. And so when it comes to something like we're getting ready for the, to, for the first time to hire a, a, a manager to manage all of our retail experience. So that includes our taste room and all the rest of our events and everything. We've never had that position. We've done that as owners, but that's flown directly out of this process where we realized, okay, one of my goals is to shift to the wholesale model, distribution model. So in order to do that, I have to free up Jake, my partner, to focus more on our distributors. So in order to do that, I have to now backfill what he's been doing with these other things. So now we've created that, we've identified that gap we know the triggers from a financial perspective where we have to get to to pull the trigger on hiring that person and now we know exactly what that job description is and the person that we need to find now we just have to go out and find it right so that's how we kind of tie all that together and then every quarter we come back and we reevaluate those goals are we on track with these goals you know um you know perfect example last year is at the halfway point is where i just said guys our plan's screwed we're we can't we're not going to make it we have to we have to make a complete shift in our business model so that's just, you know, part of that reevaluating. You go back and you just reevaluate your plan and iterate because market conditions change, people change, you lose people, you gain people. You always have to be reevaluating your plan. You talked a, you talked a little bit about, uh, well, actually quite a bit about giving credit to your partner inside the business. What have you done or have you done anything that would, what I would call, and, and when I talked with entrepreneurs in my own businesses, strategic partners, you know, those people that are outside, whether they're mentors or even somebody that you're, you're doing, you know, the old referral game with, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, no, that's, you know, that's always, and the hardest thing I think is building your network because as a business, you're always working every day to, to just run the business, right? and keep things going and building that network outside the business is, is is absolutely critical so some of the things we've done for an example we uh we got involved in the restaurant association here in town now you might say we're not a restaurant we don't have a kitchen but um we went to a couple meetings they were giving some some presentations on human resources so we say hey, we should go to that to learn a little bit more make sure we're doing everything right and long story short jake ended up as a board member for the, the the city's restaurant board. So now all of a sudden, you know, he's looking at things from a more strategic perspective. He's talking to people at a totally different level than the account level, right? 
So and that's been a really good thing for us. So now you're talking, for an example, the Broadmoor, the, the director of the Broadmoor sits on that board. So you, so you started to engage at this completely different level. And so I think that's one area where we're striving, particularly as we start to get national, to look at, you know, what's our next move from a, from a networking perspective, right? We have a great network here in the city of Colorado, in the state. Now we have to go out that, without, um, outside of that. So one of the, we're doing an event in Arizona. So we just opened up in Arizona about three months ago. Uh, so Cam, I hope you're going down there and buying us at the local liquor store. If not, let me know the name. I'll get you set up. Um, and we're doing an event down there for, uh, for one of the nonprofits. So we're starting to expand our nonprofit network down into Arizona. And so those are just some of the ways that we're slowly trying to expand that network. But it is difficult. You know, when you break down that quadrant, urgent, unimportant, like it's the important non-urgent stuff, right? And that's always the hardest quadrant to focus your time and energy on. And, and the, thanks for thanks for bringing up the Eisenhower decision matrix, because that is. And, and, you know, what's interesting about that is those things that are, that are in the or the uh, important but not urgent category. If you're not careful, they will become urgent, and that's when that's when things happen wrong. I mean, that's that's when things become a problem because now now all of a sudden I need that I need that retail manager because my retail space is growing up, and I've got a crisis hire, and that's when people make mistakes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And those are honestly, those are the things that make you grow, right? The urgent exactly. thing yeah. keep you operating, which you have to do. That's a table stakes. But if you want to grow, you have to focus in that other quadrant. So uh, I actually had a yeah, little man. bit. <laughs> Sorry, Dad, you cut out there for a second. You. <laughs> Sorry, you cut out there for a second, Dad. Uh, but no, the uh, so I had a little bit of a fun lightning round. Phil, you fall into that category where we actually get to ask. Besides all these great deep leadership questions, we get to yeah. have some fun, just little quicker ones on this. So uh, right. you mentioned you like whiskey and you like gin. So I want to hear your favorite whiskey cocktail. My favorite oh is a Manhattan for sure, hundred percent Manhattan. Oh. Yeah. So I like rye whiskey, but I don't make my, I mean, I make them with vermouth sometimes, but I mix them with all kinds of different Amaro. I, I collect uh, Italian Amaros. So I know that's probably a different cocktail when you make a Manhattan with Amaro, but uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's essentially a Manhattan. Um, I think that's a, uh, that's my favorite. Hey, fair enough. All right. Uh, how about gin? Favorite gin cocktail? I mean, I drink a lot of gin and tonics. Um, they're very good for you health wise. Um, um, but at, so I'd say that's probably my, the one I go to the most. Um, but I pretty much, if I go to a cocktail lounge, I order a gin cocktail. I like All to try right. to come up with so many amazing things. <laughs> Fair enough. You gotta, you gotta let them be creative too, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let, I love, you know, that's the one great thing about this business. I will tell you is that I don't view our competition as the other craft distillers, either in this town or anywhere else in the country. We're not the competition. The competition is people buying corporate made manufactured spirits, right? So I love supporting fellow businesses. I love seeing the other people, things other people are doing. And we frequent a lot of other craft distillers. Oh yeah. Those little variations make the best ones. Like I think uh, our friend Tiana uh, is a bartender and she makes me a uh, Mexican old fashioned. It's got like Mexican mm -hmm. hot chocolate bitters and probably a bunch of other weird stuff that I don't fully understand, but it is amazing. Um, yeah, that so sounds la amazing. Last one, Phil, what is a home cocktail tip you have for us? Just home any sort cocktail. of little thing that might, might make our home cocktails a little bit better. Yeah. Well, the most important thing is the ice. Ice is the critical ingredient. Don't use cheap ice. Get yourself some nice ice molds. Make some good ice. Uh, you know, ice is the cornerstone of the drink. So, and then the second thing is measure, measure, measure. When you read a cocktail measure, a recipe. Don't don't wing it. Measure it. All right. <laughs> well, if you say I'm so. I'm thinking back to uh, <laughs> I, I, I was doing some work at the ranch on the bunkhouse this weekend and. And yeah, measure twice, cut once, uh, definitely cave divide. So that's a great reminder. <laughs> Let's just say oops on uh, maybe one or two little cuts in that in that project. Yeah, well, because and the reason why I say that is the key to a great cocktail is proportionality. So mm -hmm. you have cool quality ingredients in the right proportion. You can make it, every cocktail is good. So where people screw up is they usually use poor ingredients or they don't proportion it correctly. So 
measurements. Yeah. You, you can't make everything a double. Uh, <laughs> not, it's not like adding a shot of espresso to your latte. It doesn't work the same. <laughs> that's a good way to put it. <laughs> man, man, that, that's that's a tempting what did I learn. But, uh, you know, uh, what I really learned is that gin and tonic is good for it's you. Very- I like me a good gin every once in a while. You know, I put a little lime in there. Maybe I'll mix it with a, a soda water, but uh, you know, tonic water has been a cure for a lot of things for a long <laughs> and time. As, yeah, the ingredient, there. I don't want to nerd out on you guys, but the ingredient in tonic is quinine. And quinine actually accelerates the movement of zinc from, from your, uh, your digestive tract and your blood system. So that's why it's really good, is it accelerates zinc and zinc obviously fights all viruses and bacteria. See, Miss Suzanne, it ain't just me. Hey, it's a so there you go. prescription. <laughs> there we go. That's, I'm coming down there to get my prescription <laughs> from you. <laughs> Camden, how about you? What'd you learn? Well, I got to add one from, from that lightning round there. The good ice, I had never really thought about that. It totally makes sense, you know, not, not that you laid it out, but having some high quality ice makes sense. Uh, but then the other piece, and I think this is just really great wisdom for whether whatever creativity you're pursuing, whether it's a business idea or whatever, that Phil, you said this and I was asking you about like, you know, trying to find that balance. And you said that you don't want it to be like your perfect. You want to kind of take one or two steps away from that. I think that's such a really interesting way of making sure you don't, you know, drink your own Kool-Aid type of thing. Of If this is my idea, and we know it ain't perfect. We got to take at least one step out. We got to take a little bit of feedback, go away a little bit. Because if it's perfect to me, then it's probably not perfect for everybody else. So I think that's a really interesting, uh, interesting counterbalance to that. Bill, how about you, man? What did you learn? Uh, well, what I learned today, you today or in the business? <laughs> today. While we were talking. Huh? While we were talking. Oh, while we were talking. So well, while we were talking, let me think. So you know, I, I think that um, you reminded me about um, expanding the network, which is, um, you know, I, I said it sort of flippantly there that it's in that quadrant, but it's true for me personally. I am not a good networker. I think if I was to say one thing that the military did not propel you well for is networking. Um, and um, I think that that's a skill that I don't do particularly well. And I'm I'm working on, and you kind of reminded me of that. I was like, you know what, I got to. As soon as you asked me that question, it was like, okay, here's some gaps I got. I got to start filling. <laughs> awesome. Well, what we're here to help, right? So, yes, sir. <laughs> Phil, how do folks find you? Uh, find where where is the tasting room in Colorado Springs? Number one. And where the heck can we buy some of your sweet liquor? All right. All right. So our taste room is at 520 East Pikes Peak in downtown Colorado Springs. So just east of downtown on Pikes Peak. Um, you can find us if you're if you live in the state of Colorado. We're in pretty much every decent liquor store. Um, and, and if there were not in there, you should tell the owner of that liquor store to get us in there and uh, send me a note. And I'll send my sales rep over there to get us in your local liquor store. Um, we've also started distributing in Arizona and we're in probably about 20 locations in Arizona. And then we just opened up in California as well. I think we have one or two accounts in California. We just got in there. So that's going to be growing here in 2024. Um, but if you can't reach any of those, we do sell direct to consumer to about 30 States. So you can buy it directly from us and we'll ship it to your house. Um, not every state is on there because of the crazy wacky rules that we have in this country. Um, but you can find us on 1350distilling.com, 1350distilling.com. And if you forget, it's 13 stripes, 50 stars of the American flag. There we go. There we go. And thanks for uh, explaining that, too, because I forgot to ask you that earlier. So, <clears throat> Phil, man, it has been great having you here today. Uh, can't wait to catch up with you down at the t- tasting room here in the next few weeks. Yeah, cause we'll come by and, uh, and we'll... Uh, We'll have a little toast, but hey, thank you guys. I really appreciate you guys hosting us, and uh, it's great to talk to vets, uh, pet entrepreneurs. Uh, it's a, it's it's running a business is tough. It's fun, but it's very rewarding. So highly recommended for your for the people out there that are thinking about it. Love it. Awesome, Camden, run us out. 
All right. Thank you all for listening to today's episode of 10X Your Team with Cam and Otis. And a special thanks to our guest, Phil Bragg, for joining us today. Remember, you can watch full episodes of the show on YouTube at 10X Your Team. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please make sure to pass along to other lifelong learners in your tribe so they can enjoy it too. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. As always, the full archive of episodes available at www.10xyourteam.net. Thanks again, and we'll see you all next time.